Hey, Troy Campus. Hey, happy Sunday. So glad that you are with us. Before I tell you where we are headed in the day, I want to mention and remind you all to come to midweek a week and a half. So it's not this coming Wednesday, but it is the following Wednesday. And we are going to be kicking off, or actually we're going to be continuing on in the series that we've been on, really called Set Apart. And what does it actually mean for us to be different in this world? And so it is going to be a worship night. And so we want to invite you, whether it's in person or whether it's on stream, to join us that Wednesday, a week and a half from today. Also, today we are kicking off a brand new series called The Power of a Story. And we're going to be looking at this extraordinary story that Jesus told in the Gospels about what to build our life on. And Nate Marialki, he is going to be leading us. And so I am really, really excited about where we are headed in this day and in this series. And so I am so glad that you all are with us. Happy Sunday, everyone. doing this morning we are so glad you decided to join us whether you're here in person or watching online we want to say welcome to Kensington Church we want to invite you all to stand if you're here we want to invite you to stand or if you're at home you can stand as well and sing with us this morning here we go
Thank you guys so much. You sound awesome. While you're standing, I want you to say hi to someone in whatever way you're comfortable. Maybe fist bump, maybe just a wave, maybe a wink, whatever it is. We're glad you're here. Welcome to Kensington. We're so glad you're here with us today. If we haven't met yet, I'm Taylor Kanagowski, Interim Director of Internships here at Kensington. I have a couple of announcements, but first, let's celebrate the Hope Water Project Gala that took place last weekend. We have a long-standing commitment to bring clean water to the Pocot people of Kenya, but we've never held a fundraiser quite like this before. There was a delicious dinner, entertainment from some super talented artists, and a few words from our founding pastor, Steve Andrews, and Craig McGlasson from our Orient campus. By the end of the weekend, we received enough donations to dig five five new wells in that dry region, which will literally save thousands of lives and build communities. With water, everything is possible. Health, education, churches, and more. We are so grateful for those of you who attended the gala and all of you who continue to support this mission that God has put in front of us. So my first invitation may be for you or may be meant for you to pass along to someone you know. Come work with us. That's right. Come work here at Kensington. Join our staff. We currently have several full and part-time positions open. So let me ask you three questions. One, have you been wishing you could do something more purposeful with your time? Two, does your heart thrill over a mission to transform neighborhoods, communities, and the entire world in the name of Jesus? And three, do you want to work in an authentic, community-oriented workplace? If you answered yes to all three, then you are a match. Browse our open positions at kensingtonchurch.org jobs or on the Kensington Church app. I'd also like to extend an invitation to young adults ages 18 to 29 to join our community-based ministry. 1829 is what we call this community, and no matter what campus you attend on Sundays, we all come together on Tuesday evenings at our Troy campus. During this season, there is a deep need for having community and establishing a family, especially for young adults. But we're also in a season when we're afraid to commit to things even to people. So I'm going to ask you to take a risk. If you are a young adult who is ready to connect in a great community, take a risk. If you are a young adult who wants to grow in your faith, take a risk. If you're a young adult that wants to make new friends, take a risk. Take the risk and join us at 1829. We can't wait to get to know you. Let's return now to our service. I'm excited about starting our new series, The Power of a Story. We're focusing on the thought-provoking stories told by Jesus, the master storyteller. Let's listen together. Good morning, Kensington. How are you guys doing? Hey, it's so good to see your faces. Welcome to those of you that are joining us online. We can't see your face, but it's so good to know you're there. If we haven't met yet, my name's Nate. I'm the worship arts director. I have the joy of leading this amazing team. I love this team that I get to lead. And I, while I'm in this spot, while I get this chance, I just wanna, just wanna say how proud I am of them, not be, just because of their talent, because of their hearts. And that includes everyone you see up here, everyone that's back there in the booth, everyone that's back in the, the cameras. Can we just thank them for a minute? Well, as Taylor said, we are starting a brand new series today called The Power of a Story. And you and I know that stories are very powerful. In February of 2020, the movie The Call of the Wild came out. It's a movie based on the famous novel by Jack London. My wife and I wanted to go see this movie, so we decided to go. And I did some research before going to the movie, so I had pretty low expectations because I found out that they used CGI for a very important character. It's a story, The Call of the Wild is a story of a dog named Buck and his adventures in the wild. But instead of using a real dog, they used a CGI dog. So my, my expectations were kind of low, but we went anyway. Sat through the movie, it was really good. Credits roll, I run to the restroom, come back and my wife is sitting on the bench outside the auditorium just weeping. She's just bawling to the point that people are coming up to her and asking her, are you okay? See, she was so moved by the story of this dog. And I'm thinking, Kat, it's a CGI dog, come on now. But she was so moved by this story that it literally changed our lives because a few months later, we brought this gift home for our children. 
A little beagle puppy, a little beagle puppy changed our life. This dog is now two years old and every time it wakes me up at 3 a.m. howling outside at something outside in our backyard, I wish we never would have gone to see the movie, The Call of the Wild. But stories are so powerful. They really do have the ability to change us in a profound level. I love this quote by an author named Leslie Marmon Sokol. She's a Pueblo Native American, and she talks about what stories mean to her culture and really to our culture as well. She says this, I'll tell you something about stories, she says. They aren't just entertainment, they're all we have to fight off illness and death. You don't have anything if you don't have the stories. You don't have anything if you don't have the stories. And Jesus knows us so well. So when he came to earth and he taught us, he didn't just come and teach us theology like all the other leaders of his day, all the other teachers of his day. He came and he led us with stories. Stories that we call parables. What what is a parable? A parable is a short story that Jesus told to illustrate a spiritual or moral truth. In fact, about 35% of the gospels, the the first four books of the New Testament, 35% of the recorded words of Jesus are these parables, these stories that Jesus told us. And the brilliance of these stories is that they're simple and yet they hold incredibly profound truths that even today, even right now, can impact and affect our lives forever. So for the next four weeks, we're gonna dive into these parables, these stories of Jesus, but not only on our weekends, we're gonna dive into these things throughout the week. And our discipleship team has created some content for us to engage with throughout the week, and they're gonna gonna be able to send us some devotions and thoughts and prompts throughout the week. So if you wanna take a part in that, you can actually take out your phone and you can text the word story to the number that's coming up on the screen. If you text the word story, our discipleship team will be able to send us some devotionals, devotionals and things like that. And they're not gonna blow your phone up. They're gonna send some stuff at just the right time in our week so we can keep on engaging with this together, not just on our weekends. But I'm really excited to dive into with you today on this. Another one of our teams here at this church is helping us. Our media team, our amazing media team has put together every week a short video to explain the different parables that we're gonna walk into. So this was created in-house. And so sit back and enjoy the next three minutes as we unpack the parable of the wise and foolish builders. There once were two brothers. Both wanted to build a home for their family, so together they went to the master builder. The first brother listened intently, taking notes as the master builder spoke. But feeling bored and a little hungry, the second brother sighed. Why are we wasting our time with all these details? He thought. When the brothers left the master builder, both went in search of the perfect place to build their home. The first brother spent hours surveying the land, but the second brother did not. The first brother sought out the best materials he could find, while the second brother grabbed the cheapest materials possible. And so it went. For months, the brothers worked. The first brother often referred back to the master builder's plans, while the second cut corners, eager to finish early. One day, the second brother walked past his brother's home. I have to say, brother, your home is nice, but not nearly as big as mine. And it's taken you twice as long. But the first brother just smiled and went about his work. The seasons changed and the brothers worked, one finishing much earlier than the other, until both homes were complete. But that very night, a storm rolled in over the hills. As the rain fell, the second brother began to notice leaks in the ceiling. The storm grew, and while the first brother played games by the fire with his family, The second brother frantically nailed a tarp to his leaking roof. The second brother spent the night carrying buckets of water, boarding up windows, and doing whatever he could to keep his home from being destroyed. When the storm cleared, the second brother was exhausted. Trudging through the soggy debris, he looked out over the hill. And there, to his surprise, he saw his brother's home, standing tall, untouched, in the morning light. This powerful story is found in the Gospel of Luke in chapter six. In in Luke 6, 46, Jesus starts telling us this story, but he begins with a question. He begins with this question. 
He says to us, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? As I look at this question, see, I don't think Jesus is asking this in a snarky or a rude way. I believe he's asking this to get to the heart of the matter. So before we jump back into this story, we're gonna look at this question and let, let it sit with us for a minute today. So the first part of the question is this, why do I call him Lord, Lord? Do I regard Jesus Christ as Lord of my life? Do I know him as Lord? What does that even mean? See, the word Lord is not a word that we commonly use in our culture, but what it is, it, it means that he is our highest authority. He's our ruler, our, our boss, if you will. You know, when we have a Lord in our life, we live at the mercy of whatever Lord is in our life. And all of us, all of us have a Lord in our life or Lords in our life. We're all serving somebody or something. You guys remember the, the famous songwriter, Bob Dylan, he recognized this. He wrote a song called, You Gotta Serve Somebody. It came out in 1979. How many of you guys remember that? Oh, now you guys are showing your age. <laughs> that was the year I was born, actually. It was released in 1979, and, and he said this in the song. He said, it may be the devil, or it may be the Lord, but you're gonna have to serve somebody. See, submitting to the Lordship of Jesus means that every part of my life, my mind, my finances, my marriage, my sexuality, my friendships, my children, my stuff are all submitted to Jesus. And, and making Jesus Lord our, of our lives is it's a choice that we get to make. See, Jesus is not the kind of person that's gonna march in and make us submit. You have to submit or else, no. What he does is he comes into our life and he lovingly invites us into his loving lordship. And that's what the lordship of Jesus is. That's what him being Lord means. And you know what? There's no one else. There's no one else in the universe that I would rather submit to than him. Because as we're talking about submitting to Jesus today, as we're talking about making him the Lord of our lives, I wanna remind us who he is and what he's done. When he came to this earth, he came as a servant. He came with so much love. He came with so much grace. He came with so much power. And he came to love us. He came to serve us. He, that, that, love, that love and that servanthood even took him to the cross where he would bleed and die and suffer for us. So if, if there's anyone in the universe that says, I wanna be your Lord, I want it to be Jesus because of his nature, because of his character, because of who he is. But there's a second part to this question. The first part was, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? The second part of the question is, or, why do you call me Lord, Lord? The second part of the question is, and do not do what I say. So before we move into the rest of the story, let's pause again. Let's sit into this question. Do I do this? Do I call him Lord, Lord, and do not do what he says? As I just got done saying, I, I wanna submit my life to Jesus. And a long time ago, when I was five years old, I had a real revelation or a real reality, a, a real awareness of who Jesus was, and I decided to follow him. And then again at 17, I reaffirmed that belief, reaffirmed that love and that desire to, to follow him. So I want him to be Lord of my life. I've been doing this for a long time, but I, I have to pause and I have to ask myself, do I do this? Do I call him Lord? and do not do what he says? And the answer is too often, yes. The answer is too often, I do. I call him Lord, but maybe I don't act like it or I don't think like it. Too many times I've been on the phone with someone, even talking to a friend who's going through something and I'll say something like, hey, you know, don't worry. You know, God's in control and we shouldn't worry. Jesus is our Lord, we can trust him. And then that very day, I'll find myself going home and complaining about something in my life. And I have to realize in that area, in that area of my life, I'm not fully submitting to him. I'm still worrying. I'm still, I'm still trying to control something on my own. I'm still trying to do something and make it on my own. So I think it'd be wise as we go through the day to sit with this question. Let it, let it sit with us for a while. Let this question do its work. Do we call him Lord, Lord, and do not do what he says? Again, I don't think Jesus is asking this question because he's angry or somehow shaming us. There's no shame in Jesus. He doesn't operate in shame. That's not how he works. He's simply wanting to expose the re a reality to us so that we can build a life that will last, that withstands the pressure and even the evil 
that will come against it. So Jesus tells us this parable, this story about building something so that we might see with fresh eyes and hear with fresh ears the kind of life that we're building. Because guys, we, we are building a life. All of us are building a life, board by board, brick by brick, moment by moment, decision by decision. We're all building something. Our decision to come here today, we're building our life. Our decision to join online today, we're building something. The decisions we're gonna make later today and this week, we're putting our lives together for better or for worse. And this parable, this story, in just a few sentences gives us a huge advantage, gives us some wisdom on how we could build a life that lasts. But before we move into the rest of the story, we're gonna take a moment to receive uh, this morning's offering. This is a way we can also show that we trust him by the giving of our finances uh, back to the Lord and saying, God, I do trust you with this very important area of my life. And I love being a part of a community that is so generous. As Taylor mentioned in the video, we just had our Hope Water Gala. Oh, weren't you so moved by those images of that well being, being dug in that dry wilderness? Wow, that's, that's, that's due to the generosity of God's people. And I love being a part of a community that does things like that. So there's the ways that you can give. Many of you understand you can text to give, you can jump online and give. It just takes a few moments. You can also, if you, if you brought something that you prepared to give today, we do have these beautiful boxes in the, toward, the, toward the exit where you can deposit that as you're leaving. And thanks again for your faithfulness and generosity to, to this place. So let's move into this story. As you just saw in the animated film, Jesus is contrasting two builders, one who's building on a solid and a firm foundation and one who's building on a shallow one. And you don't have to be in the construction business to understand how important the foundation is. Years ago, I worked for a construction company out of Grand Rapids and we were building the dorm rooms at Grand Valley State University. And I worked for a man who I'll call a gentle giant. He was a big man, but he was so gentle. He was so kind. He was a great boss, a great supervisor. But one day I came to work and he was really on edge. He was really just seemingly upset. And I asked another supervisor, hey, what's going on? And he said, oh, today is foundation pouring to, to day today. He's always on edge when this happens. See, we're moving into a new phase, a new uh, phase of building the dorms. And today, this day that I showed up to work was foundation pouring day. Well, they had the footings ready. They pulled away the, the, the earth and they were ready to pour the foundation. And I followed the supervisor out to watch, them, to watch them do their work on this very important day. And the cement trucks come rolling in and my supervisor's waving his arms at them and he's yelling, trying to direct them where to pour the cement. But over the roar of the instruments or the machinery, they couldn't hear him or they couldn't see him or something. And they poured the foundation in the wrong place. And so tons and tons of cement is being poured in the wrong place. And I'll never forget this gentle giant of a man takes his baseball cap off his head and he throws it down in just complete frustration, completely undone because he knew that if we didn't get the foundation right, the whole job was gonna be ruined. So Jesus contrasts these two builders all around the foundation of how they're building their life. So let's look at these words from Jesus in Luke chapter six, starting in verse 47. He says this, as for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I'll show you what they're like. They are like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood came and the torrent struck, that house struck that house, but could not shake it because it was well built. A well-built life one that withstands the storms that will come. And let me emphasize this, my friends, storms will come. They will come. Sometimes we can see them coming in the distance and sometimes they come out of nowhere and take us unaware, but they will come. And I love that Jesus sets us up to win here. I love the kindness of Jesus because he makes this promise. He's like, if you build your life on me, if you build your life on my words, guess what? When those storms come, they're not gonna shake you. And I'm struck by the kindness of Jesus here because he comes and he says, I'm inviting you to build your life on me. I'm inviting you to make me your Lord, to make me your everything. And here's why, 
because you will have an unshakable life. Not that bad things won't happen, not that trials won't come, but you will not be shaken. You will not be destroyed if you trust in me. And I'm struck by the kindness of Jesus here because he tells us why we should follow him. He tells us why we should obey him. Those of us that are parents and have children, or maybe you have a, a niece or a nephew, or maybe you babysit children and they're under your authority, sometimes we tell our children to do something. Very often I'll say to my son or my daughter, hey guys, go clean your room. What one word question do children always ask? Why? And what is a phrase that we as parents sometimes so often say, because I told you to? Right? Just, just today, my son came early with me to church this morning. He loves to be with me uh, on Sunday mornings. And usually I get here super early uh, to lead worship. So he doesn't come that early. But because I'm teaching today, he was able to come with me. And he walks into the green room and there's a whole bunch of donuts spread out. And you should have seen his eyes light up, right? But he had an apple in his hand because mom told him no sugar until you eat that apple. And he's looking at these donuts and I already know what he's thinking. So I don't even have to, I don't even need to ask him. I just look at him and say, eat your apple first. And he looks at me and says, why? And I couldn't believe it because I almost said, because I told you so. And, but I was already working on this message. So I knew that I actually shouldn't say that this morning. <laughs> but, I, but I love that Jesus he, he so lovingly warns us. He invites us into the wisdom. He doesn't just come with that posture saying, I'm gonna be your Lord because I told you so. No, that's not his posture at all. He comes with kindness. So let's continue the story. By contrast, Jesus goes on to talk about this foolish builder. In verse 49, he says, but the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation the moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. Oh, that last line, as I, I read that, it kind of echoed in my, in my spirit in a dramatic way. Its destruction was complete. What an interesting phrase. See, the very moment that the builder decided to build his home on a shallow foundation, his destruction was sure. It was gonna happen. It was only a matter of time before the storms came and completely imploded his home. But in the, again, in the kindness of Jesus, he's giving us a heads up. He's warning us, don't build your life on something that is temporal. Don't build your life on something that is shallow. Put your foundation into the bedrock, which is eternal, which is solid. And don't allow the troubles of life to destroy you. See, it's interesting to me that Jesus when we're talking about the wise and foolish builders, he only deals with the foundation. He doesn't talk about the siding or the landscape or the beautiful front door. He only talks about the foundation. In fact, as I thought about this, it could be that both the houses in this scenario look exactly the same. You wouldn't be able to tell which one was built on the shallow foundation at first. You wouldn't be able to tell at first which one was built on the stronger foundation. In fact, maybe the one that was built on the shallow foundation had nicer siding, maybe it had nicer landscaping, maybe it had a nicer roof, maybe it had a more beautiful door. But, we, but that's not the whole story, is it? Because foundations are hidden. And often it's the hidden parts in our life that are areas that make us or break us. We've all been saddened, we've all been hurt when we've seen a coach or a teacher, or a politician, a leader have to step down from their place of authority because of cracks in their foundation because their life imploded in some way, because their integrity didn't, did not hold up under pressure. And it's especially painful when it's a pastor or a leader. Why? Because we have this wisdom. We have this wisdom from Jesus. We've had this warning. We've had this call to place our trust in him so that our life doesn't have to implode. But it is those hidden places that sometimes start to show up and we don't know. We don't know we don't know what our foundation is until pressure comes and cracks start to form in the foundation. And when that happens, then we gotta pick up our heads and we gotta make some decisions. A few years ago, our, the lead pastor of our campus, Danny and his wife, went through a major trial when their actual house was sinking, their actual house. And so Danny lets us in on a little bit of what they had to go through and how they had to deal with it. Check out this story for a minute. In 2000, my wife and I bought this home and we were excited. It was our second home. 
at, at that point, our two boys were two years old and then just shy of one year old when, when we moved in. And we were excited for a couple of reasons. One, that we had a lot more space, but, but the other reason was that my parents just lived a couple streets away. And so our kids were gonna be able to grow up with their grandparents. I never had that experience growing up, so I was excited for our family and for our kids. The first two years, it was awesome. And then something started to change in our home. The first thing that started to happen was some of the doors wouldn't work. They wouldn't lock or they wouldn't shut fully or you'd have to really put your shoulder into it. And I couldn't figure it out. I tried everything. I would reset the door, have someone else come and reset it. It would work for a while and then it wouldn't work. And then we started noticing some of the windows wouldn't fully shut. We'd have to really crank on them to get them to shut. And then we started noticing all these cracks around the house and it would start small and then it would spider crack and then we'd notice even in the bricks, some cracks that would start to happen outside. And we knew that something really bad was, was happening. So we started to research it. We started to bring people in to help us. And eventually we found out that everything on a 42 inch footer, which was the front porch, the garage, the family room, and the little sunroom we have off the back, all of that was sinking. And as it was sinking, it was pulling on our main home and it was pulling on the roof. In fact, at one point, uh, our roof started to leak and water was coming in and it was just an absolute disaster if you can imagine. So we brought the insurance company out and they looked at it and they assessed it and they said, hey, sorry, but in your policy, th this isn't covered. We could not believe it. And then we found out what the fix was and the fix was gonna be tens of thousands of dollars. We, had, we barely had any money at that point, you know? And so we started working a lot. We started to figure out what would happen. We brought this team out and here's what they had to do. They had to actually dig huge holes. Actually, we put 30 holes around our home, and then they did peering. There was a couple different kinds of peering, but what we decided to do was something called helical peering, and there's these big kind of helical piers that they would wind down all the way down, probably 9, 12 feet until they hit bedrock. They'd wind it down into bedrock, and they'd attach it onto the foundation, and then they would lift that foundation up. They ripped up every part of this home, and when they left, they pushed it all back. We had to do all the new landscaping, everything. But at that point, our home became stable again. It's really the foundational things, even within our own lives, that, that make us secure. And when I look at this home, you know, I don't see a super fancy home, but, but, but here's what I know. The most money I've invested in this home is under the ground. It seems like a total waste of money. You know, the foundation is dirty, it's hidden. No one's ever gonna go, wow, what a nice foundation you have. You know, it's just this kind of nasty thing. But what we realize is it's the most important part of our home. In fact, if a flood came through here right now, they told us that if everything washed away, this home would still be standing here because it's rooted in bedrock. And so for me, many times when I think about our home, as much as it was a frustration, it's also a reminder to me of my own personal spiritual life and our spiritual life that the most important work we can do is the foundational work, the work that maybe we never, never see, you know, that's really hard, that's kind of dirty internal work of our heart, mind, and soul. But that kind of work that God does in our life is really the kind of work that puts us down into the bedrock of God and keeps us in, no, in every situation as steadfast as we can be. Even when he's not here, he's still teaching us. I love that guy. But what a nightmare. Can you imagine? You're excited to buy a house or you're thinking about all the memories you're gonna build only to find out that the house is sinking. But you know the most amazing part of this story to me is that Danny and Amy, they decided to stay. It would have been easy for them to kind of just cut their losses, just cut and run, just take the loss, take the hit, walk away, not deal with it, but they stayed and they decided to dig down deep. They chose restoration. Even though it cost so much and took so much time, they chose restoration. And you heard what he said, that house is actually stronger today than it ever would have been without the restoration. You know what, guys? We always, we, all of us will we'll find, we'll, all of us find ourselves in times where there's cracks that show up in our lives. All of us do. And maybe you're there right now. Maybe, maybe some of us have made decisions that have caused our whole life to implode. And you're, you, you need to do the work, the, the foundational work of digging down deep and allowing God to bring some healing to the foundational places in your life. Let me tell you the good news though. The good news is that restoration is not only possible, it's already been paid for. 
Jesus paid the great and expensive price for you and I, for our lives to be restored, for our lives to be built on something that is better and that is stronger. And in, some, and in many ways, as we allow Jesus to restore our lives, our lives can be better and stronger and firmer than they ever would have been had we not gone through the struggle. So some of us need to grab a shovel and start digging. Some of us need to get back on our knees and start praying. Some of us need to open up scripture and start reading. There's some of us that need to find a trusted, trusted friend and start confessing, bringing stuff out of the darkness and into the light so that we can start healing. And here's the thing, Jesus gave us this parable because his desire for us is to build a thriving and resilient life. Jesus doesn't want our life to implode. He desires for us to be resilient. That's why he gave us this parable. So let's go back to the question at the very beginning. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? It's a question that the story doesn't answer, but shows us what's at stake. Everything is at stake. And the story is meant to have us wrestle with this question and then motivated to find the answer I believe we can begin to change at a foundational level. So as I've wrestled with this question this week, why would I, why would we call Jesus Lord and do not do what he says? I've meditated on this question and I've come up with a few possibilities. The first possibility is this, maybe we've offered our hands to him but not our hearts. We offer our hands and not our hearts. Maybe we've, we've accepted Jesus as our savior. We've become convinced like the, the song we started with today that he picked us up, he turned us around, he set our feet on solid ground and we thank the savior. What a wonderful savior he is. Maybe we've reached out and we've asked him to take our hand and be our savior. And I don't wanna minimize that at all because what a wonderful savior he is. We should celebrate that. Let me, let me just encourage you today, if, if you're not putting your trust in Jesus to, to save you, to forgive you, to give you an assurance of eternal salvation at, after this life is over, let me, let me just encourage you today, don't even leave this place without saying, Jesus, I wanna trust you. I wanna put my faith in you. But maybe we've offered him our hands and we said, Lord, be our savior, but maybe we're still holding back our heart. We're okay with him being our savior, but maybe him being our Lord is a different thing. Oh, there's so many times where I've become awakened to this reality that, oh, you know what? I'm trusting Jesus to save me, but there's areas I'll, sometimes I'll I'll realize there's areas in my life I haven't fully submitted to him. I haven't really given my heart to him fully. I remember a few years ago, uh, there was an issue that was in my life that was causing me pain and causing my important relationships pain. And so I decided to go see a counselor and talk through the issue, see if I could get some relief, some help. And I'll be honest with you, as I shared my pain with the counselor and I shared my story of what I was going through, I was kind of thinking and hoping that the counselor would say, oh, I understand. I was kind of hoping that he would just coddle me a little bit. I was kind of hoping that he would even say, well, you know, it's really not your fault. It's the fault of all these other people in your life. But he didn't do any of that. Instead, he asked me a question that literally caused me to pivot my life. And this was just a few years ago. He asked me a question, he said, so, he heard my pain, he heard my issue, and he said, so, what haven't you submitted to Jesus yet? Oh, and I sat back and I thought, well, I've been following him for many, many years, but as I listened to that question, I began to realize there were areas in my life that I hadn't submitted to him. See, I had offered him my, my hand, but there were parts in my heart that I hadn't offered him, and I had to learn how to trust him and say, Jesus, you can be Lord of everything. And maybe we've offered him our hand in another way. Maybe we've lifted up our hand to give him a high five and we see Jesus as our buddy. He's our friend. And you know what? I don't wanna minimize that either. Jesus did come here. He did call us his friends. He invites us into the intimacy of friendship with him. He, he loves that, but maybe we've only seen him as our buddy. Maybe we've, we've high-fived him. Jesus, you're my buddy. But you know what? We've gotta move beyond that. If we wanna build a life that lasts, if we wanna build a firm foundation, we have to move beyond him just being our buddy, just being our friend. He wants to be our Lord. And maybe we've offered him our hand in another, another way. Maybe we've, we've held out our hand for a handout and we see him as our sugar daddy. We see him as the one who just answers our prayers, the give me what I need. 
Now again, I don't wanna minimize this either because God does call himself our provider and he does love to provide for and bless his children. That's a part of his nature. That's a part of his heart. But if we wanna build a firm life, we have to go beyond just the Lord give me what I need. He has to become everything. He has to become Lord. In Matthew 16, 24, we see a very pointed verse. And this is a big one, guys, admittedly. Matthew 16, 24, Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. Oh, wow, we have to deny ourselves. What? I have to deny myself? That's not the message that you and I have heard ever since we were little children. That's not the message that this culture throws at us every day of our lives. We don't, we don't get the message from this culture to deny ourselves. We get the message, follow your dreams, lavish yourself, please yourself. That's the message that comes from culture. But Jesus comes and he humbly and powerfully and lovingly offers us a different way. He says, if you wanna really have life, deny yourself, follow me, take up your cross. Now that doesn't sound fun to take up the cross, but it's the, it is the way that leads to life. Apostle John, one of the writers of the New Testament said that, that in him was life, talking about Jesus, in him was life, and that light that was in Jesus is the light of man. So when we follow him, we follow him into the truth of what it means to truly be a person, to be human. But this is a big verse, I have to deny myself. In fact, someone who, uh, I was just chatting with someone this week about this and this person had early in their life experienced some success in the music industry. And he was saying to me, you know, at that time of my life, the music industry or music was my God, it was my idol, it was my Lord. And when I met Jesus, the Lord of music, and Jesus is Lord, they, they, they begin to clash and I realized, you know, I had to lay this one down to make Jesus my Lord. But here's the amazing thing. When we do that, and this, this guy did that, he, he laid his music down at the feet of Jesus and said, you know what, you're my Lord now. This isn't my Lord anymore and you use it however you want. The amazing thing is that we all know what happens on the other side of the crucifixion. When we take up our cross, there's resurrection. In a beautiful way, the Lord handed back music to this guy and God used him in powerful ways that probably he wouldn't have been able to use him any other way. So when we submit to his Lordship, there's beauty, there's resurrection. And lastly, our, the second answer to, to our question is, maybe we, we know about God, but we don't know God. See, here's the interesting thing about this story. Both the wise and the foolish builders, they heard the words of, of Jesus. They heard the words. We have a lot of words available to us today. We have a lot of information. We have a lot of, uh, we know a lot about Jesus, but do we really know him? That's the question today. Do we know him as Lord? We have a lot of words available, a lot of information, but I, I think we need what I would call revelation. Revelation is when the knowledge that we receive becomes, it comes part of us. It, it, we make it our own and it, and it turns into a transformed life or a changed life. See, Jesus, he builds on revelation. He doesn't just build on information. He builds on revelation. In Matthew chapter 16, we see an example of this. One day, Jesus is sitting with his disciples and he asks this question. He says to his disciples, who do people say that I am? Who do people say that I am? And his disciples begin to rifle off answers. Some people say that you're John the Baptist, come back from the dead. Some people say you're Elijah, come back from the dead. And then Jesus looks at them and he says, who do you say that I am? And a guy named Simon Peter, one of Jesus' associates, stands up and says, you are the Messiah, you're the chosen one, you're the Christ, you're the son of the living God. And this is what Jesus says to him in Matthew 16. He says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Jesus builds on revelations. In fact, this, look, look what Jesus said. He said, Peter, you didn't get this information from a podcast. 
You didn't hear this information in a TED talk. You didn't read it in the best-selling novel. You got this revelation directly from heaven, this download from heaven. And it's so powerful, this download that you've received from heaven, that I'm gonna build my church on it. Jesus builds on revelation. Do we know him? Do we know him? I want you to hear this today. There's an invitation from Christ every day to to know him, not just to know about him, but to know him. And the last answer to the question, why do we call him Lord, Lord, and do not do what he says, as I've thought about this this week, maybe it's because we major in obedience, but we minor in love. Hear the words of John, one of Jesus' early associates. He says this, Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. What's Jesus saying? If you love me, you're automatically gonna obey me. For those of us that grew up with a a church or a religious background, this could be a real big deal. For so many years in my life, I, I really did think that God was upset with me. I really thought for so many years that I could never please him. I could never obey him. I couldn't pray enough. I couldn't read the Bible enough. I couldn't talk about him enough. And I always felt condemned. I always felt like I wasn't measuring up. Even though I was living in in that season, I was living an incredibly disciplined life. But I always felt like I wasn't quite measuring up. And then I began to understand his love. When I begin to get a revelation of the love of God, when I begin to really understand it, when it begin to sink into my life and and become a part of me, then I begin to do things, not out of trying to obey, but just out of love. So maybe we don't have an obedience problem, maybe we have a love problem. Jesus' disciple asked him another huge question one day, because they, like us, wanted to please God. I think it's put into our very heart. We wanna please God. But they came to Jesus and they said, Jesus, what's the most important commandment? There's a lot of commandments in this book. Which one's the most important? And Jesus looked at them and he said, it's really simple. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul and all your mind. And then go and love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. So this promise of new life with Jesus, this promise of being able to build a life on something that lasts is based in his love for us. We don't have to try to obey. We don't have to try to conjure up obediences. If we embrace the love of God, if we embrace who he is and we embrace his love in such a way, it will begin to transform us. And then everything we do, guys, everything we do is out of love. It's not trying to measure up. It's not trying to to build our own life. Jesus invites us to build together a life that will last. And I submit to you today that the foundational character, the foundational nature of who Jesus is, is that it is his love. This promise of new life with Jesus, this new covenant with God, he promises us that he would actually put his commandments in our heart that it would be something that would be a natural outflow of our relationship with God. We would naturally begin to build a life that will last because his love is deeply inside of us. So how do we increase our love? I think we just need to open up our eyes and see his love. And I think we can see it every day of our life. We can see his love in in our children. We can see his love in our neighbor. We can see his love in the beautiful creation he has made. We can see his love in a sunrise. We can see it everywhere if we'll open our eyes. How do we increase our love? We just open our eyes, we ask for it. So the more we elevate the Lordship and the love of Jesus in our life, the deeper our foundation the more we're able to withstand all the things that life will throw at us. When we do this, Jesus becomes everything to us, guys. See, we can't really lose because Jesus can't lose. We can, at the end of the day, we can't really fail because Jesus can't fail. And he, our lives become so intertwined with his that the world looks on and they don't even recognize us anymore. All they see is Jesus. Our lives become an overflow of him and he becomes to us what scripture calls our chief cornerstone. 
Another word that we don't use very often, but a couple times in the New Testament, the writers called Jesus our chief cornerstone. And this was something that they used in the ancient world to build a foundation. Now we would call this footings where we, dr we drill down deep and, and the footings are there and then we put the foundation on top of that. In the ancient world, they would set what was called a cornerstone. And this cornerstone would be a solid rock and they would place it there and then they would base the whole entire foundation of the structure on this one cornerstone. And so scripture says that Jesus is our cornerstone. And as we trust him, as we look to him, as we dig down deep and we say, Jesus, I want you to be my cornerstone. I don't want to build my life on something that is shallow. I don't want to build my life on something that will not last. I wanna build my life on your eternal virtue. I wanna build my life on your eternal nature. I wanna build my life on you, Jesus. Become my cornerstone. Become my foundation. And maybe today, for some of us, we're in this place and we, don't, we haven't heard much about this Jesus. For some of us, we just need to say, you know what, Jesus, I want you to be my cornerstone for the first time. Some of us need to dig down deep, as I mentioned earlier, and allow the Lord to do some repair work on our foundation. Some of us need to come back to the cornerstone and say, Jesus, you are it. You are the one I wanna build my life upon. And, and I wanna take that promise that when the storms come and when the waves come, my structure will not fail. The structure of my life that I'm building will not fall, it will not sink, it will not be lost because you are my foundation. So let's believe, let's reaffirm, let's trust that Jesus is our cornerstone. Can I ask you to stand with me if you're able to? And we're gonna sing a couple songs. And in this time, this is our response to say, Jesus, you are our cornerstone. And then we're gonna sing, we're gonna sing this phrase, Lord, we wanna build our life upon you and your love, because you're worthy. Let's sing together.
powerful and wise phrase to say, I will build my life on your love. You know what that is? That's just us saying, God, we trust you. We can see your love poured out for us in Jesus. And we sing this song and we say to you, God, yeah, I am gonna build my life on that. I might not understand it all, I know that there's gonna be trials. I know that there's gonna be struggles. I know that there are gonna be times I wanna give up, but guess what? Through it all, I am going to build my life upon love that will last, upon love that is eternal, upon love that will impact the world and change us all at a profound level. I will build my life on that love. And maybe right now we're, it's early, Maybe one more time, we could just sing that together. And, and this time, and in light of everything that we've heard as we've had this parable that Jesus told about the wise and the foolish builder in front of us today, maybe in response to that one more time, we could just say, God, yeah, that's me. I am going to build my life upon your love. And if you feel compelled and, and, and you feel like you're comfortable, you could do this or wanna do this, maybe you could just lift up your hands and just say, yeah, Lord, in this moment, I am going to build my life upon your love. This is my trust in you. This is my commitment to trust in you, to hand my life over to your Lordship. One more time, could we just sing that together? Just, just gently to the Lord. Let's say, I will build. Say, I will build. It is a firm fire. I will put my trust in you alone and I will Yeah, just like that, let's do that one more time. I will build my life. I will build my life. I will put my 
trust, I will put my trust in you alone. And one more time, let's just keep singing one more time. Let's say, I will build my life, Jesus. I will build my life upon your pray together. Jesus, your love is a firm foundation. Your love is something that we can build our entire life upon. You are our chief cornerstone. And I'm asking this week, as we walk through these next seven days, I'm asking for you to reveal your love to us in new ways, that we would open our eyes and we would see your love so that we can build it upon it. Help us to love our neighbors. Help us to love those that are different than us. Help us to love those that disagree with us so that we can build a life that will last. Lord, I pray you bless everyone who's assembled here, everyone who's joining us online. Bless them with a realization of who you are. And we wanna call you Lord. You're our savior and you're our Lord. You're our friend and you're our Lord. You're our provider and you are Lord. So become Lord in our life. We love you, we bless you in Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for joining us today, guys. We bless you, pray you have a great week. We'll be right back next week with another parable. So we hope you can join us. Don't forget to text stories to that number so you can join with us and engage with us through the week. God bless you guys, have a great week. We'll see you next week.